we don't know what the addition of Quinshawn Juckins in that locker room is because it wasn't good at Ole Miss. He had offensive linemen just leaving him on the turf and wouldn't help pick him up. There were some internal struggles there, and he immediately bolts, goes to Ohio State. So you have to get that to work in your locker room. And then you look at what Will Howard did at Kansas State, and he's just not a deep ball thrower whatsoever. What's going on, everyone? Bear Bets Podcast is back with another college football preview edition. I'm your host, the Bear, Chris Felipe, Jeff Schwartz, alongside me again, Colin Wilson from the Action Network will join us in a little bit to go over a whole bunch of uh, college football betting options, uh, make miss playoffs, season wins, conference, all sorts of uh, some, some good stuff. But uh, but Jeff, it, it feels like college football season now officially is here. Uh, as we do have an official ranking out, the coaches poll is out. Uh, Georgia getting 56 of the 46, rather, of the 55 first place votes. And uh, the, the rankings kind of shook down the way I kind of thought they would. Ohio State 2, Oregon 3, yeah. Texas 4, Alabama 5. A little surprised Ole Miss is ahead of Notre Dame at 6, Notre Dame 7, Michigan 8, Penn State 9, and Florida State at 10. Yeah. Uh, wraps up the top 10, Missouri 11, LSU 12, and Utah, the highest ranked uh, Big 12 team at 13. So uh, any any anything about the rankings that you saw that? Yeah, the it, Alabama's rankings do not match their odds to do anything this season there. Um, you know, also in the SEC, I wrote a couple weeks ago, are, are plus 800. I think they've slowly dropped down to about plus 700 now to make the playoffs. I just saw today it was about plus 100. They're the fifth-ranked team in the country, Bear. They're probably a playoff team, right? So it doesn't feel like those are kind of with, – with, with what Vegas feels about them and the coaches feel about them. And I'm high on Alabama, too. I think they are a playoff team. That was a little surprising to me just to see kind of the, the difference in the way Vegas looks at them versus the way maybe the coaches look at them. And, and really, outside of that, it's about right. Um, I don't see any glaring issues. You know, the back half of the rankings, I mean, Arizona's 21, Bear. I know we're sort of – a little split in Arizona, but that feels high for them. USC being so high at 23, kind of surprising to me. me. Um, but it feels about right outside of, of that. Yeah, and I'm going to give a, give a shout-out to Sully, our producer here. He actually, we were talking before uh, we went on. Like, If you look at the what the playoff would be, obviously no, no, no games have been played, but the way these rankings shook down, you've got one team from the Big 12, you've got one team from the ACC, You've got the group of five team, and you got nine teams from the Big Ten and SEC. Yeah. And I'm not sure that's probably not the way it should be, at least going into the season. So I, I I'm curious to see once the year gets going, uh, how the uh, the committee, once we see those rankings, how they how they look at different teams and how they uh, view conferences. Are they going to look at to be uh, equitable along the Big Twelve and ACC? Because I'm not sure uh, those two leagues are in the same ballpark as the Big Ten and the SEC are. So I would think. If we get eight or nine playoff teams from the Big Ten and SEC, then uh, the mission of the twelve team playoff will be will be uh, accomplished. Get the best teams in the in the in the playoff to win uh, a national championship. The, the other news that came out from uh, the CBS Sports report about um, the big uh, about the the SEC and Big Ten injury reports. Now, I'm not sold that this is going to be. Uh, the end all, like I think a lot of people are hoping for it to be. I think we're going to get a lot of lower body, the hockey playoff injury report, uh, lower body, questionable, uh, did not practice, questionable. So I, I'm not sure us as gamblers and handicappers are going to get a whole yeah. lot of it. Am, am I wrong in that thinking? Do you think otherwise? Well, it depends on how serious they are about it. Because last year, I believe there were some teams or conferences that did it themselves. But it was to your point, it was Jeff Shore's lower body. And it didn't really give it an actual status. And, and I think some of it, too, was done like 90 minutes before the game. So like an NFL inactive list, right? And the NFL inactive list is 90 minutes before the game, but it's most of the guys that haven't played in previous games and guys that are on the injury report. Bear, if they're doing it for real, an NFL injury report, right? It is a practice designation. 
right? L no practice, limited practice, full practice. And then it also is a body part, not just lower body, upper body. Um, then it's an actual thing because right now we don't know, right? There are lots of times that we get information from sources and from other people. And obviously Vegas tends to get a lot of this as well, where, hey, we hear so-and-so is not practicing this week. That now will will and should be included if we're doing a real injury report, Bear. But doing a Fugazi one where they just list names with random things and upper body, but full practice, that doesn't matter. But really it comes down to how specific it's going to be. And also one position, right? Quarterback. Otherwise, it, I don't. I can't imagine a line moving very much because a wide receiver is listed on injury report. A quarterback, though, a knee, a shoulder, bear, an ankle that we don't know about, and they finished a game, but next week they're listed on injury report. That's something that could be very valuable. I go back to two years ago. Now, remember Bo Nix, Utah, end of the season? He got hurt against Washington. It was like... Mm -hmm. Uh, was he playing? Was he not? I got a good information. He was going to play. Uh, I think I let sort of us in on it, uh, and 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 we took Oregon there. But now that will be an injury report. So the info, you know, the inside information now would not be available to uh, to other people before it comes out. So I think it's better for injury reports. I'm pro injury report bear. I'm pro making this fair for everyone and putting the information out there. We all have the information. Um, it, it leads to less nefarious things possibly happening. We talk a lot about whether games are fixed or players fixing stuff. Injuries, man, not being public and getting leaked out is more detrimental, in my opinion, than it is whether or not a player is betting on their prop. I, I, I agree. Like, I, I'm, I'm pro, look, I am pro injury report and pro information being out there as well. I think the challenge now for us uh, is going to be being able to weed through the injury reports figure out what is real, what what is a, a <clears throat> what's actionable type of information, and maybe uh, before uh, it, it officially hits, because because I'm with you. We've had uh, coaches just lie to us in the past about players playing on the field of a game, on the field. Oh, no, he's good to go, and then doesn't play. So you, like, well, you, were part, you, you weren't part of this, but wasn't there a Utah Cam Rising with Washington State? They're on the road, and – they do a whole thing where Cam Rising is going to, like, they do a whole package before the first snap yep. of Cam Rising, and he, he didn't even play. Yeah. He wasn't in the huddle yeah. before the game. Oh, yeah, and I, and I heard, I believe me, I had I heard from people after that game who were who were none too happy with uh, with Kyle Whittingham and, and, and Utah for kind of being uh, <laughs> let, let, let astray from theirs. But, but someone who is not going to lead us astray uh, is, is Colin Wilson of the Action Network, does such a great job over there. Happy to have him join us uh, to talk about some college football previews, some, some futures, some awards, and a bunch of other stuff. So uh, without further ado, here's uh, here's Jeff, Colin Wilson, and myself. We're joined now by Colin Wilson of the Action Network. We had a fun time at, at Big Ten Media Day, buddy. That's an interesting yeah. event. It was my it was my first time there. How would you describe the the vibe at Big Ten Media Day? The well, the food was terrible. I think I had a tweet about that, it was, but but otherwise, it was kind of a regular media day till maybe Deshaun Foster hit the podium and everybody kind of woke up and said, "What's going on here?" Uh, it was a lot of fun, and I think you know the conversations you and I had about offensive lines because this you know this is the time of year where I want to know about your trench. Everybody's got quarterbacks and wide receivers. Tell me about your trench. So it was a lot of fun. Did you leave Big Ten Media Day thinking one of the teams in that conference is going to be a national champion this year? I did leave with the Ducks. Yeah, I, I've told you about this. I I think the difference, and we're going to get into this, the speed at the skill positions, I think, can't be matched. Uh, and you know what? Oregon, even back to the crystal ball days, has been building in the trenches. Uh, they, they've had big boys in the trench. Atlanta gets there, and he just keeps on recruiting like it's Georgia. So when you have it in the trench, you're going to be able to take on the rest of the Big Ten. So, so you look at the... The recent uh, the coaches poll just came out. So we don't have the AP yet, but uh, 53 of the 55 first place votes did go to either Georgia or Ohio State. I think Georgia got 47 of them. So uh, the dogs clearly the the consensus favorite, and they probably should be. They were probably the best team in the country last year. Just uh, lost a game at the wrong time with some weird circumstances to Alabama uh, in the SEC championship game. Uh, I had brought this up last week, but when I was out in Vegas a couple weeks back, uh, I had a prop written uh, Ohio State in Georgia uh, versus the field. And actually right now, the, uh, the field right now is favorite. I think at like minus 125, uh, getting the update from uh, my buddy Chris Andrews at the South Point. But uh, I bet Georgia and Ohio State versus the field, I think they are, 
uh, the two best teams. Uh, I think that there's a really, really, really good chance you're going to get at least one of them in the national championship game. Then you can put yourself in a position uh, to maybe play something back on the other side if you're feeling a little bit uneasy. But uh, where where do you stand? Do, do you think it is? Um, I mean, you just kind of hinted on your your love for Oregon. Uh, <sighs> you think just I shouldn't say love, but but you just mentioned how impressed you were with them. Do, do you think that there is a legitimate chance that Oregon uh, is the best team in the Big Ten over Ohio State? Who I think most people think is. I, I do think Oregon is the best team in the Big Ten, and I've got some love for, or maybe some non love for Ohio State. We could talk about it a little bit, but Bear, I think you're right on that bet because Georgia is the first bet that I made. I walked out of Houston from the Michigan Washington national championship game out of the press box. Odds just flew up. I was in the media bus on the way back, and I said, Georgia five to one, and they're they're having a playoff format where you got to win at least three games in the month of January. You're going to have to have depth at the two deep everywhere to survive this kind of playoff bracket. Georgia's the only one at the time. You know, there's other teams that have two deeps. Texas has pretty good two deep, but Georgia's the only one that we knew was solid and we knew is going to be there. Even if they don't win the SEC, we know they're going to be in there. So to me, Georgia is the side of the bet I'd be on. So I'm with you. I would take the Georgia Ohio State side. Yeah, Jeff, I think when we were doing one of the episodes of Airbats last year uh, in December at the time, I think Georgia was about four and a half to one that uh, that we wound up getting on. I can't remember where it was, but I definitely remember firing a little something in on Georgia last year before the season even ended, thinking that they would be the uh, the best team coming back. Yeah, I mean, it's always good to have those those numbers. Colin, you mentioned the, the depth, right? They might, they might be needed to win. Which of these top teams – would you fade thinking like, all right, the depth, one deep is good, but two deep is a little bit concerning. I think there, I think schedule needs to be a part of it too. So I'll, I'll do schedule and the two deep. There's four teams. I just, I can't see them falling out of the top 10. Ole Miss, Penn State, Georgia, and Oregon have schedules that say that they're going to win 10 games. And I think that they have the depth, what they've done in the portal, depending, you know, Ole Miss. I love Penn State's coordinators. I just, there's no way I can see these teams falling out of the top 10. But if there is a team, as I'm staring at the coaches poll, Michigan doesn't have a quarterback that can throw. I mean, you're going to live on Jack Tuttle or are you just going to pull a Penn State in the second half and just run the ball up the, you know, between the tackles the entire time and not allow your quarterback to throw? That's not sustainable. And that's probably not going to get you to stay in the top 10 there. So that's, I think Michigan is, is definitely at the top of the list for me. And I don't have a lot of love for Texas, but I'll save that one here coming up. Yeah, it's funny because there's a law as a lengthy history uh, of it's, it's something like 29 of the last 31 years. I haven't updated the the number yet where you've had at least one team uh, from the preseason top 10 that has not finished uh, ranked at the end of the year. And can, can I make a make a case maybe for Florida State? Uh, I agree with you on Michigan. You would expect that they'll lose to Texas, lose to Ohio State and lose to Oregon. And it probably wouldn't be surprised if they if they dropped another one, given likely offensive woes. But Florida State, you, you lose what, get what, 10 starters back. You lost basically everybody on defense. Are we sure? DJU is a power four type quarterback, all new skill position players. You've got the Clemson game. You go to SMU, who could be tricky in their first year uh, in the ACC. You go to Miami. You go to Notre Dame. The Florida game, who knows, at the end of the year. Heck, even the opener in Dublin against Georgia Tech can be a little uh, interesting because the Jackets punched above their weight last year as well. Mm-hmm. So I think if I had to I had to vote for one, I think Florida State might get my vote as the uh, the team that might be the unlikely candidate to fall out of the top ten. I mean, I would agree with you because if you look at the ACC schedule of defenses that you have to face, you have to have a quarterback that can get into a secondary and expose them for explosive plays. And are we sure DJ can do that? He had a great offensive line at Oregon State. He had great play action pass from running backs that allowed him to get downfield, but he never showed that before. The DJU thing, man, I I like his family. Like, I I, I like – I just don't buy – I. I just, I don't buy it, man. I hate to be mean about it, but like I, he can put in 59% of passes at Oregon state in a, in a very pass friendly offense, you know, like that, that's often set up for success. I just don't see it happening at Florida state. I'm, I'm sorry. That would cloud my judgment on, on Florida state making any sort of playoff run. Um, so I'm always kind of cautious to say, you know, mean, not mean things, but negative things about players that and families I like just to, the, the, uh, the truth of it. Speaking about things that, no one might like to hear, but you have to say anyways. Let's hear your Texas take. To not make the playoffs is about plus 170 right now. Are you going Texas no playoffs, Colin? 
I'm going Texas under, but not under 10 and not under that juice 10 and a half. I'm going under nine and a half on an alternate Ooh. team total. It's plus 160 out there. And listen, when when Sark came into Austin, he came out on fire. He was fourth in red zone TD percentage. Last year, that fell to 120th. I talked to Sark at SEC Media Days. I said, what's going on at the goal line? He said, listen, when you lose Roshan Johnson and you lose Bijan Robinson, you don't have the Rocat to run uh, their form of the Wildcat, then you're going to have some, you know, some problems getting into the end zone. There's other things going on. Like there's a real study on Quinn Ewers right now about his efficiency, how it takes a dip on timing rights, like curls and hitches. He's just much better at go routes. And then look at the secondary. This is the reason Washington won that playoff game is because the secondary was just picked on most of the season. We knew that was going to happen. You get Andrew McCuba coming in from Clemson from the transfer portal, it really kind of replacement numbers. There's nothing like huge about any of the defensive backs that they have this year. This team is not as good. And when you don't have Murphy and sweat on the defensive interior, you can't drop seven into coverage. I think Texas is in for some trouble. Yeah, It's interesting that Oklahoma and Texas, I think in their first year in the sec, probably not ready for the complete schedule. Like, I mean, you guys know you can, like, like Texas did last year, going to Bryant Denny and winning a game. You can fire a, a great performance in there every now and then, pull an upset, beat beat these teams in a one-off. But the the repetition of facing multiple SEC depth type teams in a row is a heck of a lot different than than just saying, okay, we have Alabama in our place and we nearly beat them, or we go, go to go to Alabama and and we catch them and, and beat them. So I think there are going to be struggles for for both Texas well, and Oklahoma in in year one uh, in, in the SEC. So we, we kind of alluded to it before, hinted at some struggles maybe at Ohio State. Uh, Buckeyes, second choice to win the title. Some team people actually have them power rated higher uh, than Georgia. Probably no team in the country outside of maybe Miami spent as much and did as much uh, in the portal as the Buckeyes. And we still don't know if it's Will Howard for sure at quarterback. It could be Julian saying uh, we, we we think Jeremiah Smith is going to be an absolute freak. But uh, tell me, tell me, and tell Jeff, and tell everyone out there what, why why aren't you as sold on Ohio State as most? There's a lot of moving pieces to this team, and there's a lot of things that none of us can see. We don't know what the addition of Quinshawn Jenkins in that locker room is because. It wasn't good at Ole Miss. He had offensive linemen just leaving him on the turf and wouldn't help pick him up. There were some internal struggles there, and he immediately bolts, goes to Ohio State. So you have to get that to work in your locker room. And then you look at what Will Howard did at Kansas State, and he's just not a deep ball thrower whatsoever. He had as many turnover-worthy plays as big-time throws when you look at passes over 20 yards. I just don't think that they're going to have a long shot if he's back there. It's great for Chip's offense, who wants to run double-back sets, but – you know, I mean, is he going to be able to be sturdy enough to take on the bulk of that offense? And the price bear is horrible. Can somebody tell me why this team is like minus 700, minus 750 to make the playoff and Oregon is minus 300 and they're both have the same win total? By the way, Oregon hosts Ohio State. Then there's one other issue I have a monster problem with with the Buckeyes. Remember when Jalen Milrow couldn't get a snap at his ankles in the Rose Bowl and it cost Alabama <laughs> the game? Well, that center, that center, Seth McLaughlin, is now the center at Ohio State. And if you look at what Chip Kelly did at UCLA for a number of years, he runs shotgun or pistol in 88% of his offensive plays. This McLaughlin thing at center is a real deal you have to watch. Yeah, that's a it's a little inside football there, guys. A little little center snap <laughs> uh, me mechanics here. Uh, look, I mean the the Chiefs did it with Creed Humphrey last year, so I think Ohio State hopes they can get away with it uh, with their new center. Uh, look, you need to settle a, a, a debate for us here, Colin. I am pro Miami. Bear is a Miami grad. He is he is anti Miami. Maybe he's holding some you know some some cards close to his chest there. But uh, well, I'm not I, pessimism, my friend. I think Miami can win the ACC and be a playoff team. It all comes down to whether or not they let Cam Ward be Cam Ward. What are your thoughts on Miami? I do have Miami plus 200 to make the championship game. There's a couple books out there that will take that. I love the make the championship game because then you're really handicapping the regular season and you're pulling one game to hedge to make that. That's a perfect bet for them when you look at their ACC schedule. The fact that they don't have to play Clemson, you can kind of really focus in on Florida State. And I think I would rather defer to Bear to talk to them because I have problems with win totals in crystal ball and this whole taking a knee thing, right? I If I have to lose <laughs> money on a season-long win total on that, it's I just 
just, I, I, it's like one of those things where you're like, I'm just done betting, right? It, that would hurt that much. So I do like them to make the championship game, but, and my numbers say what, 9.8 wins. I, I mean, they're right up there at the top. I but yeah. So I, I think they're good, but I'm going to take them to make the championship game two to one. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. The, the championship game is in the ACC championship game. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Not the national side. <laughs> it's funny because I, yeah, I was going to say, you talk about a terrible price, two to one to win in the, in the national. Jeez. <laughs> But it's but as I said, I guess I do have a bit of alumni pessimism. I I could see, this team could go nine and three, and it wouldn't surprise me. They could lose in Gainesville to open the year. It would not surprise me. This team could go eleven and one and wind up making the college football playoff. Like I think nothing in between there surprises me, and it, and it, it worries me. The only thing I don't worry about them getting up for Florida State. Or, or, or getting up for a game like that. It's a, it's the games like at USF when, you know, mm-hmm. Alex Gore, like the, actually Jeff I reached out to you a couple, I, they're not going to be a big favorite in that game per, no. your, per your power ratings. Like that's the type of game that worries me that it's see, like they haven't beaten North Carolina in forever. So it, it, it's interesting there to see um, if, if they could put it together this year, I mean, they, they certainly uh, are expecting that. And here's a, here's a team that I think you would think is going to put it together this year. Uh, Missouri, like, like you're pretty, pretty bullish on the Tigers this year, aren't you? I am. And you should, I see all the negative stock indicators. I see it from they overachieved last year. I see it from, you know, probably a little bit of coaching out of the shoes. And even I admit that I think Blake Baker did not do a good job as defensive coordinator there. They finished outside the top 100 and and defensive finishing drives outside the top 100 and tackling. That's not sustainable on defense to have a winning program, but then you, (laughs) and you lost Cody Schrader and the, everything that I got from the SEC media days was, yeah, we got Marcus Carroll and we got Nate Noel, both Sunbelt running backs. That's great. That replaces the numbers. But Cody Schrader was the locker room leader. He was the guy that texted everybody and said, we're eating dinner here now and I'm driving the car. So that leadership has gone there completely. Then you look at the schedule, right? You, you try to be negative on Missouri. You look at the schedule and you think, oh, my goodness, this team is a shoe in for six and two. Could lose to AM and Alabama, but they might make it seven and one in SEC conference. And a lot of teams might make it to seven and one. That gives them a good shot of making the championship game. Like I said, I love these championship game bets. Five to one for Missouri to make it. And this conference, this schedule is just a joke. You pulled the greatest SEC schedule you could possibly get. You just hedge against Alabama and take a five to one to make the SEC championship game. Right. Yeah. It's, it's what, one of the, the top six teams in the in the SEC they face. It, it's still there's still a little bit of hesitation on my part because I do think. Auburn's not going to be a gimme game. Oklahoma's not going to be a gimme game. South Carolina there probably won't be. It wouldn't be surprising to me if, I mean, I mean you, you know, Coach Drink kind of every now and then says some things and some other coaches in that league aren't necessarily huge fans of his. So, like, if they were, if some one of their opponents kind of got up there and circled the wagons for a game, pulled, pulled an upset, it certainly wouldn't surprise me. So we hit on some of the teams that were in the top 10, maybe could fall out of the top 25 by, by the end of the year. Is there, there's also a little bit of a history of teams that haven't been ranked in the preseason that wind up finishing in the top 10, which I guess would mean that this is a team that currently isn't ranked, maybe could win their league, maybe could win the, uh, maybe could reach the playoff. Is there someone just outside there, either receiving votes or not receiving votes that you might think might fit that bill? Yeah, I got two of them, and it would just blow your blow your hair off your head if you were listening to this and you thought these guys. The first one is SMU. SMU joining yep. the ACC. I listen. They, they have gone portal heavy in the trench. Brett Lashley really has something going on down there. Ridiculous defensive numbers. I'm talking like top ten and everything from like line yards and coverage. Get into the ACC, boy, did they get blessed by the scheduling gods yep. in that in that conference. So I project them at 9.6 wins. I might have one of the highest win totals ever. And then the other one is Rutgers. You want to talk about leaving the <laughs> East Division? You want to talk S-U-N-J. about leaving, <laughs> yeah, leaving no. the East Division in this schedule? And Kaliak Manis gets his OC back. Highest experience numbers on both sides of the ball in the conference with this schedule. Oh, my goodness. Shannon's got something going up there. They are such a surprise team this year. Well, my my best bet last week was Rutgers over six. So I feel like I feel like that's making the rounds after people at Big Ten Media realized their schedule, right? One other Big Ten team I, I want to ask a question about is Iowa. I feel like as a sort of CFP contender, 
10 and two is very doable. 10 and two in, a, in the Big Ten is that is that a playoff team? Is Iowa worth making a, uh, a to make the playoffs wager? A oh, 10 and two I, in the Big Ten absolutely is playoff bound. Yeah, and Bear, I agree with you. I think I only have maybe six or seven teams even projected to be like at nine point nine and above. I mean, it's hard to get ten wins this season. So I think at the nine and threes during selection day, it's gonna be. But let's just say Iowa does make it ten and two. They would make it. But I'm gonna throw a little fly in the ointment. And the fact is, is you know, Kirk Ferentz went out and got. Tim Lester from Western Michigan to come run the offense. Now, listen, the first like five years he was there, they were top four in the Mac every year. And finally, before he departed, they fell off, but that's okay. He, went, he was an analyst and now he's there. Kirk says he's a perfect fit for what they do. But I go and look at what Lester did at Western Michigan. He is heavy, like almost 100% RPO and four verticals down the field. And you have Cade McNamara uh, and you have uh, the Sullivan kid that transferred in from Northwestern. Neither of those guys can run the RPO. As a matter of fact, I think Cade McNamara's whole injury situation with the ACL is because he tried to take a dive up the middle. So I, I don't know if Lester's going to tailor this down to 25% of his playbook or actually try to run RPO with these two quarterbacks, which I don't think is going to work. So that's the fly in the ointment with the Iowa Hawkeyes. Yeah, I worry about Iowa a little bit as well, Colin. Like, I, for so long... It was like the ultimate complimentary football where you knew the offense wasn't going to do much, but the defense was going to get on the field, get three and outs, get people off, and get the ball back in good position. They were going to punt. They were going to pin teams, and they were going to do inherit the ball near midfield, and they were going to win close games. I, with the new offense now, I wonder if it's going to be as uh, simpatico as it had been uh, in the past, and I'm curious if it doesn't go well, uh, how right. Kirk Ferentz handles that and having to to fire his son and bring in and maybe open up an offense that he really didn't want uh, to do that. Uh, right. I think if you maybe look at the Big 12, I wonder <laughs> what you thought of think of the Big 12, just because well, I think I don't want to lead you with lead you to an answer, but I, I think everyone here is just kind of assuming that it's either going to be Utah or Kansas State, but but I think this is a conference that you might need to look a little bit deeper. I think if you're looking for someone kind of really off the map uh, to make the playoff, I, I think two teams that we were talking about maybe that aren't getting uh, votes right now or getting a few votes or aren't in the top 25. I think UCF, who I played it. 13 to one to make the playoff and Iowa state is another team. Those two teams might be worth the play because I'm not sure it's as easy as just saying Utah, Kansas state, one of them wind up winning this league. I have to say uh, those are my two picks to make the championship game. I will say this, the big 12 preview that I wrote over at action network longest preview I've ever written in my life because <laughs> half the teams, eight teams I had to consider that could win the championship here. So what makes these two teams different? Iowa state I talked to Matt Campbell. I said, where did this explosiveness come from? They finished top 15 and run and pass EPA. That's not what Iowa State's football is. Iowa State football is three tight ends, move the chains. Well, they've got that with Benjamin Brommer. He's going to be a monster at six foot seven at tight end. But Jalen Noel and Jaden Higgins on the outside average more than 2.6 2. yards per route run. That is highly explosive. And Rocco Beck, I said, I asked Matt Campbell, I said, where did this come from? He said, the only thing I can say is that his tape from high school looked exactly like Brock Purdy. So we should be in for some big things. So, it's a good thing. yes. I, Iowa State's never finished with more than nine wins since their program started in 1895, but I am betting, I've already bet them. And then UCF is the one, and you're talking to an Arkansas alum here. KJ Jefferson is going to run this offense, and Gus Malzahn said the words out loud, this is the closest I've ever had to Cam Newton when I've coached a team. And I just, I mean, as an Arkansas grad, KJ had some, uh, the last two years, if not, it's not fair. It's the elements around him, what he's had from an offensive coordinator with Dan Enos, losing Traylon Burks in 2022. Now he has Penny Boone, the best running back in the Mac. He already has RJ Harvey in the backfield. What defensive line in the Big 12 is stopping these guys from running the Wildcat from Gus Malzahn? They're about the same size too, Jefferson and Cam Newton. Like they're just yes. <laughs> very similar in in just stature. And Cam Newton, by the way, is when you see him in person, it's shocking how large he is as a human to play quarterback. Like he is a a big human being with with uh, Jefferson as well. I, I feel like Colin. Utah, maybe two, three months ago, was looked at as the favorite, like overwhelming. Like Utah's going to win this conference or they're moving in here. It does feel like that's fading a little bit now. What is it about Utah or maybe their schedule? They have Oklahoma State, Arizona back-to-back -back early in the year, and they go to UCF Thanksgiving weekend. What is it sort of about Utah that maybe people are sort of jumping off their bandwagon right now? 
I heard a term drop at the Big Tool Media Days in Vegas, and I just shook my set, shook my head, and I said, "Oh my gosh, we're now the NBA load management." And all of a sudden, I, all of a sudden, with all the injuries that Utah has had, they're talking like, "Hey, if we get it wrapped up in the championship game, or we got our playoff seating intact, we're going to go to UCF the last game of the year." And load management could actually be a thing, which is another reason why I like UCF. But I think the better bet for Utah is you know that this is a nine-win schedule, could be a ten-win team. We don't know. And I, I've said this over and over. I think these conferences are going to have like a bunch of eight and ones, a bunch of seven and twos. And then how do you figure out who goes? The better bet to me is Utah to make the playoff. Not only do they have the pedigree of being Pac-12 champions multiple times, would the committee not love to have a home game in Rice Eccles Stadium? Holy cow, that would be fantastic. But I think that they'll have a good enough record. I don't think experience even matters con considering what they did last year with the players. They were switching offense and defense like Sione Vaki. So yeah. uh, Utah to me is a, is a better playoff bet than they are to win the Big 12. Before we let you go, everyone is just kind of uh, infatuated and enthralled with who the, the non-P4 team to make the playoff is going to be. Uh, <laughs> I have some thoughts. I'd like to hear uh, your thoughts. If, if you have indeed given it a thought, like, like who, who do we think might be that 12 seed? I, I think it's going to be App State. I really do. I think they're the class of the Sun Belt. Texas State is getting a little bit too much love. Uh, they do have a game on the schedule against Clemson. And considering what App State has done with North Carolina – and if, where that game falls on the schedule, if they can have a good showing, maybe lose by a possession or cover the game and look good there, they can take the rest of the schedule and they can make it. App State is, is my favorite. I have a lot of problems with Liberty, strength of schedule, and you got embarrassed in the in, in the Fiesta Bowl. I don't think I could ever bring myself to put money on them. <laughs> I, I bet on Oregon in that game. I felt comfortable doing that. Yeah. Uh, as soon as Bo Nix uh, Bo Nix was was announced is going to play, um, I felt I felt pretty good about that. Is, is Memphis a team? By the way, nine and a half win total. Uh, Florida State early in the year that does not matter to making the playoffs, right? I mean, it does, I guess, for overall record. But are they, I mean, nine and a half is a big number for a team. I don't think people realize has that win total. Yeah, I don't think Memphis can make the playoff. There's a little bit of regression coming in for Silverfield. And, and uh, you know, in that conference right now, the two teams that I love the most are uh, Rice, uh, which I, I've hit Rice at six, six and a half, seven. Rice. I think I'm just going to keep. I mean, when when you get uh, EJ, EJ Warner down there to throw with that offensive line and Bloomgren's offense, which is now like up-tempo and confusing everybody, I love Rice. And if you want a real sneaky team that I think is above 60 to one in the market, Look at East Carolina and look how soft that schedule is. They have two games that are against other G5, big-time G5 teams that could make the playoff. ECU brings so much back in that conference, and that schedule is absolute cake. If you want a real long shot to make the playoff, look at East Carolina. I'm, I'm just glad you didn't say Liberty, you didn't say Boise, because <laughs> I totally agree with you on Liberty. I, again, I don't... I don't think the committee does this year to year, and I don't necessarily think that they should, but I think there's got to be so much. There's got to be a thought in that room where they made us look so bad last year by just seeing that they were undefeated, and we're going to throw them in their group of five when we all knew SMU was better than them, and they go out and absolutely get annihilated by Oregon, totally non-competitive. I think that probably is going to be filed away in a few people's minds when they're when they're doing the rankings. Like, hey, we we can't fall for this again. So, what else you got going on, Colin? Where where where, where can we find your stuff, and what what do you got cooking? Yeah, I'm over at Action Network, Big Bets on Campus YouTube channel to catch all of our previews of every single team down to Kennesaw State. We've got something to talk about, how they left the triple option. Uh, at Twitter, <laughs> at underscore Colin1, Colin with two L's. You guys can find everything there. Thank you so much for having me, guys. Yeah, I, thanks, I, love, I love joining it. Appreciate it. Great catch up with Colin there. We got to, to talk at Big Ten Media Day. He's he's fantastic, guys. Go follow him, Action Network. He really knows his stuff. Him and, and Bill Conley at ESPN do a great job of getting lines up, setting lines, sort of being the first people out there that is not Las Vegas and putting these numbers together for the public. So I, 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 uh, I really uh, implore you to follow him if you enjoy uh, gambling as much as we do. All right, Bear, time for, for best bets. I think we're going to sort of focus on uh, some playoffs here for college football. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I think we're gonna both go to the Big Ten. I think so. I'm, I'm curious to uh, to hear your your rationale behind the next one. But I'm gonna go with Penn State uh, to make the college football playoff uh, at minus 140. Kind of talked about it with Brett uh, Siancho last week about is this a CFP or bust type of year for the Nittany Lions, and and I kind of think it is. And we we kind of kicked it around like like no team uh, was better suited and. Uh, 
did the expansion to 12 really fit more than Penn State? If you go back over the last eight years, uh, they would have made the playoff in this scenario six times. Uh, the seven lost straight losses to Ohio State didn't matter. They don't play Michigan this year. The defense is still loaded. Uh, Tom Allen now in his defensive coordinator uh, for Manny Diaz, who's moved on to Duke. Uh, I am not a Drew Allard guy. Uh, he has been spooked, and he looks just scared to not check the ball to do a back or a, a short receiver or a tight end. We'll see if Cole Nicky, who comes in from Kansas, who ran such a, a high-powered motion-based offense, can get uh, the message through to Drew Allard to be a little bit more productive and maybe take a few more chances. So uh, I got Penn State to make the college football playoff at minus 140. I think 10-2 and two, uh, certainly gets them there, and I think that's probably the most likely record for the Nets this year. Uh, I'm with you on, on Penn State here. Um, I think they're a playoff team. We talked about the start, right? Nine, You get nine teams in the SEC and the Big Ten, and I think Penn State's one of them. The other one I'm going with, Bear, Iowa, Iowa to make the playoffs at plus oh. 790. Let's talk about this, Bear. 8-1, to one, I mean, eight to one I, best bet. I love it. Iowa won 10 regular season games last season, averaging 15 points a game. 10 games last year, averaging 15 points a game. If they're just a little bit better on offense, what do they turn into? A 10-win a team easily again? But let's talk about schedule, okay? Because a lot of this matters about schedule. Yep. Okay? They have Ohio State. They're at Ohio State in week five. Tough game. Going to lose that game. No Oregon. No Michigan. No Penn State. And no USC, who is who basically is, they're getting the big, basically they're they're getting the Big Ten West schedule again. Yes, like they're, they're they their schedule is super easy. They get Nebraska at home, like which is a, might be by week uh, by by Thanksgiving weekend. I'm pretty, pretty good. Iowa State to play. Too. They're at UCLA and Michigan State in conference. Like those are wins. They're going to be ten and two again. Bear, you're ten and two in the Big Ten. You have a chance to be in the playoff, right? It's going to be between them and. What maybe in Old Miss ten and two like Texas Alabama I don't know they'll be in the mix at least Bear and I have eight to one right now for Iowa to be a playoff team I'll take it that I like I like that that bet I, I might have to I might have to tell you on that I'm glad you said Old Miss too because I really didn't get into it with Colin uh, I, I didn't do a good job of following up. I, I think I talk about Miami having a wide range of outcomes, like between nine and three and whatever. I think Ole Miss is one of those teams that might have a wider range of outcomes than uh, that. They could they could be that team that maybe finishes uh, unranked that begins in the year in the in the top ten. But uh, I can't wait for our NFL pod to come up. Sammy and Will are back with the gambling group chat. Uh, we'll kick around a bunch of NFL stuff as well but that, that'll that'll do it for college we'll be back next week with another uh college preview pod maybe we'll grab another guest maybe we'll have the gambling group shot part of the uh the college pod next week but we'll try and make it uh, absorbable and not throw so many different things at you where your mind's uh, going all over the place and try to keep a focus on a couple of things that way you can uh really dive into a certain market or two so uh appreciate everybody out there again for watching on the youtube channel downloading wherever you consume your podcast remember rate review and subscribe uh, and tell us how great we are or how awful we are uh, for colin jeff i'm bear most importantly remember the less you bet the more you lose when you win <laughs>